In 1831, James Garfield was born to a poor Ohio family. When he was just two years old, his father passed away, leaving his mother to care for him and his many siblings in their log cabin. Throughout the years, he took on odd jobs until he had saved enough money to send himself through school. After graduating from Williams College, he returned to Ohio to take a job as a professor and was quickly promoted to the university's president. Then, in just a few short years, he threw his hat into the political arena and was elected to the Ohio Senate. If life had not been an uphill battle for him from the beginning, perhaps he would not have been ready to take on the challenges that would follow. As he took office in the Senate, the country was falling apart. Southern states were seceding at an alarming rate, and it was becoming clearer by the day that civil war would be imminent. He focused his efforts on keeping his district united while reaching out to Southern politicians to forge bonds. But for as valiant as his efforts were, fate had other plans. By the age of 31, Garfield was now serving the Union as a Brigadier General, leading successful campaigns and gaining recognition for strategic aptitude. Ohioans could not be more proud of their fearless leader, and they elected him to Congress. Though hesitant to accept the position at first, President Abraham Lincoln persuaded him to lead on the political front. Following the Civil War, Garfield purchased a large farmstead in Mentor, Ohio, with plans to make it self-sustaining. The house had been built in the 1840s in the Greek Revival style, but had been added on to many times over the years. When he purchased it in 1876, the house went under a series of meticulous renovations, adding 11 more rooms onto the house to make room for as many children. Before we go inside, let's explore the incredibly fascinating grounds and uncover how Garfield made the farmstead self-sustaining. First, we will find the pump house rising high above its surroundings. It would pump water from a well into a 500-barrel tank. The water was then sent underground through a pipe to supply running water to the indoor bathrooms and sinks, a luxury which was incredibly rare for the time period. Furthermore, a large pocket of natural gas had been found below the property, and a gas holder was installed. The storage tank would filter the natural gas through a water tank before dispersing it to the house where it powered the gas stove, gas fireplace, the boiler, and gas lamps. With no need to rely on anyone else for water or gas, he hired a caretaker to live in a cottage on the property. He would take care of the chickens and collect fresh eggs and raise the farm animals, ensuring that the family would always have fresh meat. Now with this appreciation for self-reliance on the forefront of our minds, let's head inside and see how Garfield lived. Entering the house through the front door, we arrive in the stair hall. As we pass by the staircase, let's note that the house has been painstakingly restored to the period in which the Garfields called it home. As we reach the end of the stair hall, we'll hook a right to find the reception room. Here we find another, much grander staircase, receding behind the fireplace. When we compare it in its current condition to the old black and white, we can see that not much has changed over time. Let's take the opening near the front of the room and see the parlor. The parlor was the heart of the home while the Garfields lived here. We can imagine them gathering in front of the hearth, reading stories until it was time for their kids to go to bed. And much like the painting, it still appears as it did when they lived here, with reproduction wallpaper dotting the walls and ceiling. Now we will pass back through the reception room and peel back the curtains to reveal the dining room. The dining room is staged as it would have been for an informal dinner, with the family's fine china and silvers on full display. On one wall, the fireplace, with its hand-painted tiles, is nestled into a built-in hutch. And on the opposite wall, stained glass windows allow for warm, colorful hues to be cast about the room. Let's take the passageway at the end of the room and continue exploring the house. This leads to the butler's pantry, and while we won't be seeing the kitchen today, we can look at the floor plan to note the configuration of the service wing. You'll also notice that there are private and public rooms mixed together on the first floor. Let's continue upstairs to find the rest of the public rooms. From the reception room, we'll begin winding our way up the back staircase. The wood paneling here catches the soft, ambient natural lighting and warmly glows in the sunlight. As we turn at the landing and look back, we find another space frozen in time, appearing just as it did over a century ago. Let's wind our way through the halls as we search for the library. This magnificent library was added by Mrs. Garfield after James passed away, but we'll hear more about that later. In the meantime, let's begin making our way further in 
enjoying the exquisite craftsmanship and woodworking. The walls are lined with half-height bookcases, and each section is broken up by large pilasters supporting ceiling beams. Each tiny but refined detail carved into the woodwork brings about the perfect balance of ornamentation and unadorned wood grain. Hidden around the corner in the library is the walk-in safe. Mrs. Garfield was able to store priceless family heirlooms and records here without the worry that they might be stolen or tampered with. We'll make our way out of the library and head up a half flight of stairs before heading down the hall to find Garfield's snuggery. While James was still alive, instead of having a home office or a formal library, he would sequester himself in the snuggery. The snuggery is where he would relax and read or host private meetings with visiting politicians. On the second floor, we will also find a number of bedrooms, each one appearing in different styles, with some being set apart for guests and some being designated for in-laws and grandparents. The addition the Garfields added to the house made sure that each member of their family had a nice room to call their own. In 1880, Garfield threw his hat into the presidential election. He built a campaign building on his property and invited the public and journalists to visit and hear speeches. Rather than traveling around the country, he was able to successfully win the Heart of America in a front porch campaign, which allowed him to work from home. In March of 1881, he took office, becoming the 20th President of the United States. His campaign had been based on the grounds of rooting out corruption, and he fully intended to follow through. While in office, he championed the idea of a federally funded public school system, though it would take years for that to become a reality. And while living in the White House, he sought to break down the racial divide in the country, calling for equality and integration while leading by example in front of the American people. As you can imagine, rooting out corruption, calling for better education, and sticking up for equal rights brought him a lot of enemies. While most politicians seemed to make empty promises, he was keen to deliver on his word. Within four months of taking office, he had refunded the national debt, nominated a Supreme Court justice, and had implemented sweeping civil service reforms. He was giving the American people exactly what they had voted for. Everyone, that is, except for Charles Jigteau. Charles had campaigned for Garfield, and with his victory, felt that he was entitled to a choice position of consul in Paris. Of course, Garfield ran his campaign on anti-corruption, and was not about to award positions to people who had helped him without due process. Charles, who has long been speculated to have had an underlying mental disorder, followed Garfield into a Washington railroad station on July 2nd of 1881, where he shot him at point-blank range. Garfield was rushed to the White House to receive the best medical care in the world at the time, which included having the inventor of the telephone, Alexander Graham Bell, fish for the bullet using magnets and other unrecommended techniques. Without being able to retrieve the bullet, nor properly treat the wound with basic antiseptic, Garfield fell way to a nasty infection and passed away on September 19th of 1881. While his presidency was short-lived, his ideas lived on, with equal rights in public schools coming to light decades later than they could have. Today, the James A. Garfield National Historic Site continues his legacy. Which room was your favorite? Let me know down below in the comments section. And while you're there, make sure to hit the subscribe button so you never miss an exciting episode of This House.